The following presentation is part of the Technology and the Corporation Conference Series, sponsored by MIT's Industrial Liaison Program. Good afternoon. Um, I guess it's a presentation. I um, apologize, my friends. I would very much like to have been there. I had a serious flu and my doctor would not allow me to show up. I guess uh, it was about 102 Fahrenheit. So I guess about 39 degrees Celsius. So I hope uh, everything's there. I look forward to catching up with folks there uh, in Brazil uh, on the network. Anyway, uh, I'd like to see if I can give you a discussion of a number of different changes that I think are taking place in the internet economy. The first of these is presents a sense of about what I think is happening in the economy and why these are happening. I'd like to make the claim that platform business models are beating traditional product line business models. I'll give you several reasons for that. I'd also like to give you several of the implications for why that's happening. I hope we'll have some time at the end, actually, also for some questions and answers. I'm very happy to interact um, and see if we can fight with any questions on uh, any issues that you might have. So, uh, advancing to the next slide, take a look at these are the most famous companies in the world. This is a list of companies done by Interbrand, simply based on popularity. And I draw your attention to a couple of different phenomena on this slide. The companies that are growing fastest in recognition are actually Google and Amazon. Um, if you look at the size of the blocks, in fact, uh, Google, Amazon, and Apple have overtaken uh, a number of other companies. Google, in fact, uh, spends much less on advertising than Coca-Cola does. Coca-Cola used to be the most famous brand in the world, and now, well, in fact, one company is overtaking it. We can advance to the next slide. We see that 13 of the top 30 companies in the world are platform companies. By this I mean these are companies that have external ecosystems. They have um, developers, as Google or IBM does, or Samsung does, or SAP does. Or, as in the case of American Express or eBay, they have buyers outside and suppliers. There are merchants on one side of the equation and consumers on the other side of the equation. Again, much of the value is created by ecosystem partners. If you go to the next slide, we see that, so that was fame. Um, in this case, it's internet footprint. Those companies that are most present on the web are, uh, you can see here, it's YouTube, it's Google, and others. Uh, in fact, that's true. This is just a plot of the top 20 firms by market capitalization, a percentage held by platform firms. So whether we're looking at fame or technology footprint or value creation, platform firms are becoming a dominant force in the economy. I do want to argue that the product business model is broken. If you take a look at the next slide, I don't know how many of you might have the uh, Blackberry uh, as a product, uh, um, but I would argue that the product business model is broken, right? Not many of the folks still have a Blackberry any longer. And in fact, if we go to the next slide and look at market share, it turns out that um, I think we're, we're ahead one. Um, if you go back one, the market share of BlackBerry went from about half the market, 49%, to 2% in the period 2009 to 2013, and that was only four years. A remarkably fast unraveling of the company. I'd also draw your attention to the shape of that curve. Notice that it's convex. That is, it really shows there's almost a feedback loop that's taking place, but in this case, it's negative. If you go to the next slide, we can actually see a positive feedback loop. We forget that Apple, who's now a dominant company, had actually gotten things wrong in the 1980s and 90s. This shows the market capitalization of Microsoft relative to Apple, with Microsoft having exponential growth and Apple having almost flat growth. <coughs> Excuse me. So the value created by Microsoft was really by its ecosystem. We'll notice that Microsoft was much more successful. It opened and got six times the number of developers. And by the time of the antitrust trial, in fact, had a dramatically larger um, ecosystem, much more so, and that's why its market capitalization was so high. If we go to the next slide, the uh, Business Week had even predicted the downfall of Apple and and Michael Dell, who is the uh, founder of Dell Computer, of course, had been asked how he would fix Apple, and he gave up. He said, I'd shut it down and give the money back to the shareholders. There isn't a way to fix it. It's interesting how the fortunes have changed uh, over the past, uh, over the last decade or so. 
It's not just uh, technology companies, however. If we take a look at um, other tech, other companies, uh, M- Nike Shoe Company has actually managed to create a very interesting platform business model. If we take a look at what they've done, they've added data and applications to uh, the shoes. So if we look at the, the humble shoe, they've simply created an ecosystem in which you can now compete with with your friends. You can um, improve your health in conjunction with others. You can actually go, hopefully I could actually use this uh, with my doctors, but this wasn't enough to intercept the flu. But um, Nike has been very good at creating ecosystems around its sports products. Uh, Here you can see folks that are soccer clubs, sports clubs, archery clubs. Each of these organizations have been connected as a community around the product, and these communities are adding immense value. My favorite example of a company that has managed to make the transition to platform is actually that of McCormick Spice. I pose the question to you, how would you build platforms around something as simple as salt and pepper? In this case, what they've done is they've introduced a flavor print profile. They'll add information, they'll add community as before. Here, they will ask you your preference for spice, for garlic, for sriracha sauce, or mintiness. You'll then use this to recommend recipes uh, to you. Uh, you know, I've got uh, teenage kids. Sometimes it's very difficult to get them to eat their dinner. So uh, recipes that will meet uh, their nutritional needs would certainly be welcome. In this case, you can download recipes that would meet your particular tastes or those of your family. You can adjust those recipes and re-upload them. This allows you to create value for other members of the ecosystem community. In fact, we see here is a flavored geometry. You can see in the vegetable risotto rice uh, how much garlic there is or how much butter sauce there is. You could take this recipe and adjust the seasoning to your own preferences and then re-upload it. You don't even have to know the exact uh, specifications. You just need to look at your taste. But this adds immense value. So much so that McCormick Spice has now spun this off into an adjacent company, and they're now selling services to restaurants and to um, grocery stores uh, in order to sell more spice and inter- interact more with the customers. On the next slide, I want to give you an impression of um, what platforms are. Platforms, you know, products have features, platforms have communities. It's the information and communities that add value to these platforms. In effect, the platform represents an open architecture upon which other people can add value or contribute information uh, or share, as in the Nike shoe example or in the um, uh, or in the Spice example. <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, or even in the Apple iTunes example, people create wonderful amounts of content and share information, songs, um, games, etc. across the Apple ecosystem. I'm going to make the claim, uh, if you go to the next slide, that any enterprise that grows by sharing information or by creating communities can in fact make a transition of this type. And in fact, the degree to which information is a high share of the value or which communities are a share of the value predict which will transition sooner. If we take a look at a slider uh, of this, here we see those that are protected by regulation, complexity, or heavy assets will will transition later. I'm going to argue that uh, the information industries are among the very first to transition. Here you can see um, uh, Apple iTunes. You can see games. You can see... um, uh, you can see any number of different companies um, that have had large amounts of information created uh, within their ecosystems. Services is another one. In this case, um, Odesk, now uh, now called Uwork, Upwork, I think is one of the largest labor markets in the world. News is now being delivered by Twitter. Uh, education is going to be delivered by by massive open online courses. Again, services are another area where communities. We go to the other areas, uh, consumer goods are, doing, are entering the transition. Apple watches uh, are in the consumer good. Among home goods, 
We're entering the internet of things with appliance companies connecting their appliances together or lighting companies connecting their merchandise. The Nest thermostat, which is acquired by Google, is another example of public connecting. In automotive, the car are becoming platforms with entertainment services being included uh, and ecosystems of value-added services being added. If we go to the next slide, it's the same thing is true in other industries as well. And we can actually see uh, medicine is going to be transformed. Healthcare, food and agriculture is a very, very interesting example. And you see with the uh, McCormick Spice was one. We consider the case that IBM starts to offer sensors for crop yield. In this case, they can help farmers improve their yield, check the soil nutrition and the uh, water, and improve the crops. But this data is massively available. Wonderful. IBM can then use the data to predict crop yield. And with that, it could do such things as bet on soybean futures. It creates immense value uh, captured in these uh, ecosystems. Um, other industries, we see energy and mining, heavy industries, um, tractors with, uh, such as Hitachi or engines such as GE offered are also being transformed into platforms where third parties are adding services to uh, predict the maintenance schedules and improve the quality of these, um, of these products. Indeed, even governments are starting to transform. Uh, Boston is doing it, and the city, um, city state of Singapore is also transforming. Again, the degree to which is protected by hard assets, regulation, or complexity, it's going to transform later, but I think lots and lots of industries are making the transformation. Look at the next slide. The question is why is this happening? In many organizations, uh, we might have heard much about um, social, mobile, Analytics and cloud. It's often called SMAC, social, mobile, analytics, and cloud. I'm going to argue that that's true, but that's not enough. That the phenomena is much bigger than that. In fact, platforms draw value from communities and network effects. Those two things are immense sources of value. And it's important to notice that they're really outside the firm. If you take a look at network effects on the next slide, many of you will have heard of Net Metcalf's Law. Well, <coughs> of course, it's the case that a single telephone has almost no value. But if you advance that, it grows nonlinearly. You get value increasing at an increasing rate, much as we saw in the decline of BlackBerry or in the growth of Microsoft um, in the 1980s, or indeed the growth of Apple in the 2000s. Those are all network effects with value increasing as more and more people participate. There's a new interpretation of network effects, which is these two-sided network effects. I ask you, how is the column on the left related to the column on the right? Well, one of the things you should notice is that one is the supply, one is the demand side, in effect. And what happens is that each side attracts more of the other. You get more Android developers attracting more Android users or more Uber drivers attracting more Uber riders. Each of these things creates a positive feedback loop, which can account for those um, nonlinear growth patterns that we see among some of the most successful companies. Excuse me. Each side, again, attracts more of the other. If we look at the next slide, a simple illustration you might be familiar with is just credit cards. As more merchants accept a particular the credit card, and you want to advance through these slides, then you'll see uh, more people accepting those slides. Uh, cards and carrying it, then you'll see more merchants accepting it, and then you'll see more um, users uh, carrying that particular card. Again, it's a positive feedback. If you take a look at the next one, the same thing's true of Google Android. When G Google Android launched, it came out a year after Apple iTunes. To get them going, Google offered $5.5 million in prizes. That brought in more developers. You can see that advance. More developers and brings in more users. More users bring in more developers. They gave out prizes for the best productivity apps, the best gaming apps, the best entertainment apps. Google created a massive ecosystem, and it has been an incredibly successful company at creating these ecosystems across search, across advertising, across maps, across mobile. It's been remarkably good at having third parties create additional value. Uh, many of you may know that the single largest and most successful API on the web is Google Maps because they've opened it and asked other parties to add value and then route traffic, of course, through Google.
Cool. To go to the next slide, I'm going to make the claim that in any market with network effects, the focus of attention must shift from inside to outside the firm. This is the platform shift we were talking about earlier. Most of the managerial attention that uh, firms engage in is, thinking, is managing HR or managing operations or, or managing the technology. If value is created outside the firm, the focus needs to shift outside the firm. Go to the next slide. The reason is very simple. You cannot scale network effects inside the firm as easily as outside. There are simply more people. If you're going to create those feedback loops, you need to capture more people, which means you need to shift the focus of attention. Let's go to, I'm going to now try to support the claim that platforms beat products every time. So, um, at the initial Apple supply chain, this was before iTunes. As a matter of fact, this is the iPod, but it's probably even a third generation iPod. The original was white and much more blocky. It was, um, it was, pro it was absolutely a beautiful product. It was Steve Jobs of the 1980s and 90s. <laughs> all over again. Um, it was an incredibly integrated, beautiful product. Uh, standard linear supply chain. Users bought their own uh, music or they stole it from a P2P file sharing system. And there were no network effects, no, no feedback loop. If you advance the slide one further, you then see the introduction of iTunes started to create a platform. Advance one further, and you see uh, advance. Um, what happens is that Apple absorbed the retail function. The flows of music, the flows of information started to pass through the platform. But the elegant thing is, once the information flows through the platform, the money flows through the platform as well. The dance at one further, what wind up happening is that Apple then gets to take a 30% tax on the flow of all value that crosses over the platform. The first thing this does is it removes a supply chain inefficiency. It take, then absorbs one of the functions that its part, ecosystem partners used to hold. It creates a triangular relationship where Apple now owns a financial choke point and can take a 30% tax of any of the resources or value that crosses that ecosystem. And you get network effect. Its strong user base attracts content. Gamers develop games. Videographers bring video content. People bring more apps to the ecosystem. That creates value, which attracts more users, which creates more incentive to create content. You get a positive feedback. If we apply this to other products, we can take a look at Nokia, Sony, and Microsoft. This was the, Nokia, the Lumia phone, the Sony PlayStation Portable, or the Microsoft Zune. The best example here is the PlayStation Portable, which was a far better gaming device uh, than the Apple iPhone when it was introduced. Indeed, um, the personal PlayStation Portable came out the, the fall of 2007. Uh, iPhone came out that summer, and Sony's stock price went up. Everyone loved it. It had personalized controls. It was tailored. It was much better. Over time, however, Apple's ecosystem overtook it. If you advance the slide one further, what you then see is Apple's ecosystem allowed you, you're able to make calls, MP3, video, games, other things. Third parties develop things, you know, popular games like Candy Crush or, um, uh, or Angry Birds. It added immense value, which actually then crushed the values of these other ecosystem partners. There's no reason to carry the personal, uh, the PlayStation Portable if you've already got the phone or or well, no reason to carry the Microsoft Zune if you've already got the other things. The vastly stronger network effects caused the value to erode the value proposition of the competing product. Sony could have done this. Sony had fantastic, great standalone products. It had a great MP3 player. It had an e-reader. It had some of the world's best portable cameras. It even had Sony Time Warner so that it had content. But it had everything in silos, and it never created the ecosystem. Again, I want to make the claim that platforms beat products every time. Even a weak platform will tend to beat a strong product. Google is not making this mistake with Android. Google is actually being very sophisticated about creating large ecosystems, as we saw a moment ago. 
so what happens? If you advance the slide a bit further, you can then actually see the stock prices of Nokia. Nokia declined from $30 a share to $8 a share. Sony has gone from $53 to $22 a share. And the next one, Microsoft has gone, Zoom, has, they've given it up. The product is dead. The product is no longer offered. But we don't have to stop there. Going to the next one, Polycom speakerphone. That's a single product that you can simply add Skype uh, on top of your iPad. Or in the next one, the Cisco flip camera. Uh, that was a video camera that was no near that was more sophisticated uh, as a videographer device but certainly uh, the product has died in comparison to the Apple iPhone or the HP calculator that the it has a perfect emulator on Apple so that's not even an inferior product at all uh, it has every bit of the functionality of the HP calculator the TomTom -tom GPS absorbed into the phone the float the, the Flickr photo sharing service that simply absorbed into iPhoto or the BlackBerry rim each of these standalone products or services has effectively been absorbed into the ecosystem and is not necessarily provided always by Apple. It's often provided by an ecosystem partner, and it's that ecosystem that competes more effectively. So um, if you notice, by the way, Apple has now extended its ecosystem into wearables, which takes it a step further. Um, Amazon also has created an ecosystem. It's another reason they have been so successful. They've been really quite remarkable. Uh, they have um, Amazon Prime. They've got their own delivery services. Amazon Web Services in particular is this huge ecosystem where they're able to observe other people um, building their stores and see what works and what doesn't. On the next slide, I want to make the claim, again, in any market with network effects, the focus of attention <coughs> has to shift from inside to outside the firm. <coughs> again, the reason is that network effects scale more outside the firm. I'm going to argue that almost all of the traditional things that we teach in business schools change. Let me give you an example. In this case, I want to see um, I want to see why we're creating different industrial giants. In some sense, this is a you know, almost a hundred-year tour of what's happened in industry. The industrial giants of the 20th century were all based on supply-side economies of scale. These are massive fixed costs, uh, followed by low marginal costs. In electricity, for example, there tended to be two giant producers of it. There tended to be Westinghouse versus Edison. Uh, if you go well, one more advanced. Automobile manufacturer. Again, massive supply side economies of scale. Uh, there was a Ford Model T and Sloan uh, produced the, the GM car. Uh, another one was Carnegie Steel. Car, uh, steel production um, was also supply economies of scale based on the Bessemer method uh, developed in Germany. Uh, and also, there's massive steel companies in Germany and in uh, um, England in particular, but again, they tended to be giant monopolies created by these huge uh, elements of scale. And then the other example, and the final one, is the railroads. In the U.S., there was the uh, um, Vanderbilt was called the Colossus of railroads. He actually was able to tax all of the commerce moving across the country through his railroad systems. And again, massive fixed costs in infrastructure to lay the rails and to um, manufacture these large steel locomotives to traverse the country. All of these, of course, lead to giant monopoly and also led to a lot of the antitrust regulation that we originally had um, as a result of these. I'm going to argue that in the internet economy, we're seeing the same thing, but it's for a completely different reason. Network effects in economic terms are also known as a demand side economy of scale. It isn't the uh, change in fixed costs that are mattering, change in value that's being created as more people build on the product or more people um, add to the product. The demand side economy of the scale, it's the other side of the equation. This is again why I'm arguing that there's a big shift in the nature of the economy. And it is also why we're getting these giant monopolies. Uh, Windows has uh, you know 90% share or more of the desktop marketplace. You go one step further, microblogging services. It would be folly to try to compete with someone like Twitter. Uh, it's now very concentrated in the news space. If you look at 
uh, Alibaba. Uh, it's now the largest merchant in the world. Uh, it's larger than Amazon and eBay combined. Uh, huge uh, infrastructure. Or if we look at Facebook, um, it's one of the largest social networks in the world with uh, more users than the total population of China at this point. Again, I argue you're going to see lots of these antitrust issues. Uh, Google, for example, has 91% market share uh, in uh, Europe. But again, most of these are driven by network effects, or again, demand side economies of scale. This is why I argue that things are very are changing very much in the internet economy. Let me give you several examples, okay? In this case, one of the things that changes marketing and pricing. Many of you might have heard of the, uh, the shift in marketing from push to pull, having users help themselves as opposed to bombarding them with advertising messages. Another thing that changes is the nature of pricing. So this is some of the mathematics that we, um, in, that we also worked on. Uh, here you can actually see uh, the Nobel Prize was just given for antitrust regulation of um, uh, these large um, internet monopolies and also the market power and two-sided platforms. Let me see if I can give you a little economics of why this changes, why pricing is so different in this. But we'll use an example of a matching market many of you will be familiar with. In a matching market, here would be a bar. The question would be, how would you price? Would you discount to the men or would you discount to the women? Well, naturally, if you're running a, a standard bar, you discount to the women. Um, you get you, What happens is it then attracts more women to the bar and then the men come and then you can sell them more drinks. The same bar has another policy that's a very good illustration, which is they have English speaking night. So, um, you know, the question is, you know, who gets the discount? Is it the English speakers or the non-English speakers? Well, they discount admission to the English speakers in order that they can charge more uh, to the Chinese speakers uh, in order that they can actually uh, attract them to the bar and raise the prices on the other side. Let me show you the, the rule here is that you want want to, you know, as in the case of women at the bar, you want to give the discount to the side that is the strong, stronger attractant or the side that creates more value. If we go to the, um, to the plots, the economic plots on the next page, this is what it would look like if you were to charge each market independently. Think back to about 12 slides ago when you saw the two columns of one side attracting to the other. You could sell goods and services to each side. And if you price them independently, what you might make would be the blue rectangle in each side for market one and market two. But if you give away the product on one side of the market, then the consumption increases dramatically and the network effects push out the demand curve on the other side of the market. Of course, you're now losing the blue box on the left, but you're making all the money in the gold box on the right. So you're making far more money under this two-sided pricing model than you did out of an independent pricing model. This, of course, explains things like Google Ads, where you and I get free search, or you and I get free social networks in exchange for them getting to charge more to advertisers on the other side of the marketplace. I want to point out this is very different than other forms of free. Many people think of this as razors and blades or cell phones in minutes, but that's not the case. <coughs> The difference is that in those models, the same person buys both goods. The same person would get the razors and the blades, or the same person would get the discounted phone and then have to buy the minutes later on. In that case, there's no network effect across different people. If you advance it just a little bit further, that's different than um, Google giving prizes to developers in order to stimulate the development of content on uh, Android, or it's different than Amazon giving away free chapters in order to actually get more readers into its ecosystem. That's two-sided pricing. It's using, or it's different than giving a discount to women to attract them to the bar in order that you can charge men for more drinks. Again, there's a network effect that shifts the size of the market, and you can charge more or to a different size of the market. So again, the internet economics are often different than uh, just classic razors and blades, so the pricing and the push and the pull models. Another example of something that changes is finance. Network effects change the models of finance fairly dramatically, and corporate valuation models that underestimate network effects 
will not invest or will underinvest because they underappreciate how the markets change. Let's give you an example. In this case, it's only June of last year, so it is less than a year ago, there was a big debate on what was the true valuation of Uber. There was a famous finance professor at New York University who had won a Herb Simon Prize for long-lasting work, and he was expert, as we all know, because he'd even written textbooks in um, corporate finance. He'd estimated the value at Uber using the traditional tools of corporate fin finance. He estimated the global taxi market share. He estimated the risk-adjusted cash flows, and he considered, well, what are their proprietary methods? And he came up with a valuation that was about $5.9 billion for Uber. He said, these guys in Silicon Valley are crazy. Why are they putting $1.2 billion into Uber for a company that's only worth <coughs> $5.9 billion? Well, he did something um, he did something gracious, which is to put his spreadsheet up on the web and ha take anyone up on his challenge. Well, one of the people that took him up on that challenge was Bill Gurley, who was an investor in Uber. And he said, oh, by the way, that's all true, but you're overlooking network effects. In fact, he then went on to show a slide, with, which was a, a um, napkin sketch put together by the COO of PayPal, another very, very successful uh, company. And he showed the more demand you get, the more riders, the more drivers you attack, attract, which attracts more riders, which attracts more drivers. You get positive feedback. This positive feedback grows the market rather dramatically, and it scales in a way that traditional companies don't. You don't have to own the assets. These network effects give you a very different value of the firm. It's about, um, it's about 17 billion, which is what they put in. And oh, by the way, once, if you advance it slightly, advance the slide, once those prices decline, you expand the market, you can um, go into the rental car market, not just the taxi market, and from there, you can expand into the car replacement market. So a family that previously might have had two cars might now only have one and then instead use a service like Uber um, instead. And then after that, you can go into the logistics and delivery market. You're not just talking about the single taxi market. Now you're talking about four separate markets all growing into one another. That is, you've got taxis, you've got rental cars, you've got car replacement and logistics and delivery all within the same ecosystem. That's dramatically different. Again, it's shifting the demand curve. It's not just moving along the demand curve. And oh, by the way, he mentions the um, market in uh, San Francisco for taxi services is already three times what it was in 2009. So if uh, you multiply the Demoderan valuation to 5 point nine by three, you get 18, which is more than uh, they uh, created as a valuation. So it was already accurate. Today, by the way, the uh, third or fourth round of investment of Uber have already placed Uber's valuation at $40 billion. So again, this is quite a remarkable expansion of the marketplace over what uh, might originally been predicted uh, based on the traditional tools of finance. Go to the next slide. Something else that changes is the supply chain. Often you unlock new sources of value from the ecosystem, from user-generated content. The key insight here of platforms is that you often do not need to own the assets. Many of you will have heard of the company Airbnb, where you can let out spare rooms and compete with hotel chains. Another one is Relay Rides, where you know they will actually borrow your car if you're not using it. So if I go to the Boston airport, Logan, and drop off my car, they charge me $25 a day to leave my car. Relay Reds, Rides instead will, will pay me $10 a day to rent my car because they will then loan it out to someone else for $35. They'll give me 10 and keep 25. They'll insure it and clean it and give me a better uh, vehicle back. So they're paying for the use of my vehicle. They're capturing these spare resources. Or in another one, if we take a look at Instagram, that photo sharing service sold for a billion dollars, and it was not <coughs> it was not for the <coughs> the thir <coughs> excuse me for the thirteen employees, but from the thirty million users <coughs> but from the thirty million users that 
added value. I can almost guarantee that you could have had the, uh, uh, you could have hired any one of those 13 employees for less than a 13th of a billion dollars. But the 30 million users has added so much value that that was why um, Instagram was so valuable. If we take a look at the next slide, here's just another fun example of the cultural transition. Do any of you recognize this scene? It's the exact same scene, only eight years apart, uh, from 2005 uh, to 2013. In fact, some of you may recognize it as the inauguration of the Pope. Uh, it's um, uh, Ratzinger in 2005 and Borgoglio in 2013. But look at the number of photos that are being shared in each, in the second case, only eight years later. Look for transitions where information is being created and see if you can position your firm at the point of value to capture that and you can grow rather dramatically. Um, here's another example of it, right? He goes to the moon and takes five photos and she goes to the bathroom and takes 37, right? Again, here the insight is the ecosystem starts to create value. Uh, you may be able to cap that value and use your ecosystem uh, to do more with it. Um, in the next slide, here's a, here's a uh, recapitulation of these ideas um, by someone who's a VP of strategy and media who points out Uber is the world's largest taxi company but has no vehicles. Facebook um, has the most popular content in the world. It's the biggest media owner, but it creates no content. Alibaba is the most valuable retailer but has no inventory. And Airbnb is the large, world's largest accommodation seller but it has no real estate it's remarkable because they are tapping value outside the firm again it scales more differently you need to focus the attention from, shift the attention from inside to outside the next point and this is one of the most um, important ones is the nature of innovation also changes platforms must open themselves to third-party contributions if you remember the slide from you know about four or five in the beginning Apple failed to open its ecosystem in the 1980s and 90s, and despite having a better product than Microsoft, it didn't grow as fast as Microsoft, and therefore it, um, it almost lost the market completely um, in the 1980s and 90s. Mark Andreessen, one of the most venture, successful venture capitalists in Silicon Valley, and also the developer of Netscape, points out that a platform can be adapted by its users to ideas and niches and to opportunities that the original designers never anticipated. That's the beauty of platforms. If there's an opportunity, you, the platform, don't have to go create it. Your users can help create it for you. It's a beautiful example. Next slide. Here's another bit of the 100-year history. One of the first modular products, the physical products, was the Ford Model T. It could be disassembled and then reassembled by its users. Just to give you several quick illustrations, users adapted it to then create a hay carrier. They created a flour mill. They created a race car. Then they created a mobile church. They created snowmobiles. They created sawmills. And they created mobile boat carriers. All of these things were different innovations created by the user base. Let me ask you the question, do you think you openness really matters? Here is a plot of the accesses to MySpace in red and Facebook in blue over the period 2004 to 2008. Um, I want to ask why it is that MySpace lost to Facebook. You might think that a social network would have such strong network effects that the first mover would have the biggest advantage. Well, what, what really happened? In 2006, Facebook opened to from the education space, that edu to .com. That was the first thing. The second, what was the second thing that they did? They opened to developers. That's where they got the convex growth. That's that curve that you see coming up you know, sharply to the right. That's when Zynga brought the Mafia Wars and Farmville. Users started spending hours and hours on the um, on the social network and inviting their friends into the ecosystem when they really took off. The openness really, really does matter. This is a direct quote from the founder of MySpace saying that we should have done it differently. They, they made a mistake. They had, in fact, tried to own everything. They tried to create every feature in the world themselves and said, okay, we should do it. Well, why should we let any third party capture that value? We should have picked the five to 10 key features and let everyone else innovate on the ecosystem. That would have made the difference.
Right. Let me show you another. Um, so again, all he was doing, he was making the exact same mistake that Apple made in the 1980s and 90s. Here's another way to see it. So if you look at this, this is the long tail diagram. In this, imagine the platform as the layers in light blue and dark blue there. This could be the Windows operating system and the apps might uh, owned by Microsoft might be Word, PowerPoint, and Excel. Um, the apps on there are simply sorted by value. Uh, if it's the mobile operating system, Apple, uh, uh, iOS, or Android, the ones at the head of the distribution are the ones that come preloaded on the phone, such as your contact management, the ability to play um, music, to access the web, uh, and make telephone calls. Out on the long tail are the immense numbers of apps that are created by others. The point is, others can. you don't need to own all of the apps on the long tail. In fact, that long tail diagram extends almost infinitely far to the right. It goes way, way, way out. In the Apple and Android cases, there are literally a million different apps on the ecosystem that Apple and Google did not create. If you take the total amount of value um, on the left, take it, for example, Microsoft's Word, PowerPoint, and Excel versus all, all of the value created by its ecosystem partners, or you take just the apps created by Google or a Apple, and then versus the apps created by their ecosystem partners, there's an incredible amount of value out there. The ecosystem value probably swamps the value created by the core platform itself. Again, this is why I argue that platforms will help beat products every time. This next slide shows you, imagine this is the innovation trajectory of just your own internal R&D group. <coughs> so, what I want you to ask you is, what's the rate of value innovation over time? If you allow others into your ecosystem, if you advance the next little piece of it, then you can actually see, even if you start from behind, the higher slope means that it will overtake the original line. It's an incredible opportunity because what happens is if third parties add value, they increase the rate of innovation. So even if you start from behind, you have to overtake the leader. Again, this is why I argue platforms beat products every time. In this case, it's especially because the pace of innovation is higher. There's also another really interesting point. What's your cost of failure in this case? Well, it's almost zero because it's owned by ecosystem partners. It doesn't matter if a particular app fails. But what's your upside if an app succeeds? Well, you still get the 30% tax. That's a very neat innovation trick. If you can shed the cost of failure but still have the option on all, all of the upside, that's quite remarkable, and it actually leads to more efficiency innovation gains uh, as designed at least from the perspective of the platform leader. Uh, it's much more effective um, in orchestrating an ecosystem, but you must allow others into your ecosystem and you must reward them uh, for helping you out. Next slide. One other thing that changes is industry bottlenecks. Um, one of the up points that takes place is that gatekeepers uh, are displaced by meritocratic crowds, often experts, and I'll, I'll admit even you know academics are experts and financial advisors are experts, often you'll be able to go to uh, crowds in order to get them. To give you a simple example, in the next slide, uh, the Beatles were identified by Brian Epstein in Liverpool, while the Beebster was identified uh, on YouTube by uh, adoring fans. We, we can argue over the quality uh, in this case, but um, it's hard to argue with the fact that no expert was actually involved in the selection. Um, in the next example, uh, and if you, many of you might have visited TripAdvisor as a way to get expert advice. Um, that often displaces travel agents. The TripAdvisor website accumulates the data and insights of tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of travelers and reviews, maybe even millions by the time you've aggregated all of them. Um, relative to the expertise of a single travel agent, it's actually very, very difficult. Uh, there's a legal website that says that you can uh, legal zoom where you can ask questions of lawyers. And the, one of the taglines is no, no lawyer is smarter than all lawyers. You should be able to get advice from lots of them at the same time. On the right is a t-shirt design company. In this case, rather than hiring individual designers, they run design competitions 
the crowd votes on the best designs and the t-shirt company prints the very best designs. It completely solves the problem of any market forecasting because the users have told them which products will sell. So rather than having a product buyer or specific designers on staff, they used crowds to do it. Again, experts being displaced by meritocratic crowds uh, to develop the best content. The next thing that changes is strategy. Strategy changes from some of the traditional control of entry barriers into more differentiation and more uh, valuable market exchange. Uh, if we look at the next one, you know, many of you might have covered in uh, traditional models such as Porter's Five Forces. You try to create barriers to entry, a protected niche. The categories are sharp. The weapon is cost leadership. Um, what you want to do is to own the inimitable resources to give you sustained advantage or provide the core competencies. You focus simply on those single things that your firm does best. Go to the next slide. In a platform, it's somewhat different. Instead of creating protected barriers to entry, what you want to do is to create transactions volume. Uh, advance uh, one, uh, yep, there you go. You can see create more and more transactions taking place on your platform such that more value is created there, more value is absorbed. Another interesting thing is that the, the you know, it's on the previous, um, it's on the previous point. Um, the categories are no longer distinct between uh, uh, um, buyers and suppliers. They used to be sharp in a Porter Five Forces model, but here the boundaries are not distinct. You can drive for Uber today and ride with them tomorrow, or you can host with Airbnb and then become a guest immediately tomorrow. Part of the job is to have each side create value for the other or to switch sides uh, in that model. Another argument is that I'll, I think this is more like three-dimensional chess. It's not just uh, product against product, but it's ecosystem against ecosystem. How does Microsoft Xbox compete against the PlayStation? That's one level of competition. At the next level of competition is trying to ensure the ecosystem partners prefer your platform to another platform. Microsoft really strongly prefers that Electronic Arts only develop for Xbox and not for Nintendo. Or Uber really prefers that its drivers drive only for it and not for Lyft. Uh, so you have to manage the competition uh, among ecosystem partners. Another one is competition from partner to partner. Is it the case that any partner might exploit another partner? For example, Facebook had to disable the ability of developers to spam um, other social network contacts. They don't want you, or they didn't want the developers to be able to just access all of it and spam that was actually uh, harmful uh, to the user side. And then finally, the platform itself has to figure out how much of the value it shares with developer partners and how much does it take for itself. Uh, does it share 30% or does it share 70% or does it take only a small percent? Um, you know, the credit card companies, for example, only take 2% uh, of the transactions fees. How much of the value do they create and how much do they capture? Again, it's much more like three-dimensional chess. The last point here is you really do not need to own all the inimitable resources. Um, you, you have to have those in your ecosystem instead. You need to have them uh, brought to you as part uh, of the ecosystem whole. Um, you don't have to own them. You just need to have them as part of your orbit. So what's next? I actually think that these are going to drive a lot of different industries. So as we notice, one of these is City as Platform. Uh, this is a picture of some friends uh, of mine that have actually worked with the government of Singapore, and they've aggregated all of the data for transportation, for um, uh, weather, for shipping. Uh, they can even reroute taxis based on weather patterns in order to try to create more value. Cities are opening up their data layers to outside development in order that uh, they can become platforms for innovation. Another one is energy. Um, you might think that heavy assets might be hard to transform, but they're creating marketplaces on top of them. Baseline energy produced um, by hydraulic power or nuclear power is cheaper to produce. Once you hit the peak capacity, energy is extremely expensive to produce, so companies are trying to do demand management. Uh, companies, uh, for example, Enernoc, have, have arranged with large um, corporations to turn off 
their demands for power once power reaches certain capacity levels. So they are rebalancing demand and supply dynamically based on the willingness of ecosystem partners to share the load or share the burden and receive economic compensation um, uh, as a result of that. Again, creating demand marketplaces or energy platforms on top of these smart grids. Education is another one. My own industry, education professors are going to be completely transformed once courses go online. The rate of inflation in education in the U.S. has exceeded the rate of inflation in healthcare. It's terrible. Um, and so it's now you know, tens of thousands of dollars a year for families to educate uh, their college uh, college age kids. Massive open online courses offered to, to deliver those same things um, for uh, almost for free with certification only being a few hundred dollars. It'll be very inexpensive. And there are probably 3,000 colleges in the United States uh, at the moment, and a large number of these will probably be uh, disappearing as we move to online courses. Or, of course, another one is going to be healthcare. In this case, we talked earlier about. Uh, Nike creating small communities around its shoes and benchmarking uh, and sports clubs. These healthcare systems can be vastly larger ecosystems with doctors, with medical device suppliers, with insurance companies, with patients, with medical specialists, um, with uh, partnerships with government. These ecosystems can deliver immense amounts of value. Um, I've just uh, started working with a company in the Boston area that has started to do a virtual air. Airbnb for magnetic resonance imaging machines uh, because the utilization rates are so low that they're thinking of trying to share, uh, use the, the methods of the sharing economy for the extremely expensive equipment. So again, there are these platform business models entering all different forms or all different elements of the economy. So the last point really is if you think, if you believe in the power of connecting people, I suggest platforms is a good way to go. And I, if you're thinking of what your own doing, what, what you do, do with your own uh, business and industry. Think how you'd convert your own product or service to a platform. If you do, what community would it serve? How would you bring them to add value? So with that, let me see if I can take any questions and thank you for your time and apologize again for, for coughing at you too much. Thank you.